Hello, everybody. Another Crypto Wednesday show. This is show, I think, number 21. We are already almost close to half a year of running uh, our weekly Crypto Wednesday show uh, that Gordon and myself initiated, like I said, five, six months ago. We're really happy to have great, great speakers and alumni speakers and friends from all around the world in today's uh, show and in all the other shows. And today we have Hartes, and we're really grateful, Hartes, for you spending some time with us. So thank you for being on the on the show. Uh, just for everybody that's watching the recording, or maybe that's... Oh, Sander, we're losing audio yeah. or something. One second. Yeah, I'll pick it up. For everyone who's watching this show on YouTube, this has been recorded live December 2nd. 2020 we are a global institution we got sonder in amsterdam we got gordon in los angeles it is dark outside it is 5 30 a.m but i am up for you my people my crypto people and we got artes my good friend who's going to do a full intro of himself in kiev right now the city of my dreams where i'm heading in a couple of months god bless you my brother and i just want to do as a preliminary note that I love Zoom bombers. If you're a Zoom bomber and you come on here and you may say your little N-word or you show your funny graphic, I will freaking toss you to the curb and I love that shit. I am vicious, I am vicious. Bring your fresh meat, you're nothing to me. I can out meme you all day long, okay? Don't mess with Einstein, just say it. <laughs> so here we are, highest energy show in crypto. Sergey, Marco, Rolf, everyone, love you guys. Thank you, for Austin, I think I saw you pop in here. Love you all for joining. Sander, hopefully your audio is back on. So I'm going to yeah. pass it to you for a second, my good buddy. Peace, love, Sander. Yeah, we're, li we're live all over. So we're live on YouTube. We're now in, in Zoom. So everybody that, that's not familiar with the format yet. So in the first part, Gordon and myself, we initiate the conversation to, to today with Hartesh. We then interrogate, my friend. Yeah, <laughs> that's what it is. And then we get our alumni speakers and our friends like Sergey, Marco, and all the others involved. I think James is now also onboarding in the call, so we're really happy on that. Wow, we got so, a good group. Gordon, let's let's get it started. Let's and, get it started. Uh, happy uh, happy to be here again. Akej, you know what? I, let me let me set the first of all. Thank you so much for coming on the show. I've known you for a long time. You're a good man. You know you are a good man, and I, maybe you want to go in the details. You, you had a rough period of the past week or so, and the fact that you're on here is like hardcore. I appreciate it. You can go into more details as you care to um you're it sucked there's been a virus around the world i may have had it and uh, we can't I'm name okay. it right because <laughs> the youtube gods will censor us but yes you you you, you caught that thing Everything's and here you are i'm here my, i'm well my family is well uh we're grateful and yeah i've known you a long time gordon it's really great to be here and um you know we've been through the i've been through four before bear markets <laughs> yeah and i think that's it. what counts is the is the bear markets <laughs> oh you know whether, whether you keep friendship through bear markets yes you and i kept friendship through bear markets but I've, I've lost like i've actually lost a couple friends in 2020 through various reasons Can psychedelics every yeah. time there's a bear market, more and more people leave crypto for cannabis and psychedelics <laughs> yeah and well or 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 other marriages who see we'll see um okay my, so listen i, I always love and I think James half joined in also, and I think you guys are buddies, so he'll, he'll I'm participate. Celebrity, I'm so honored. You, you are, dude. We, we are honored. Okay, but you know what? Enough flattery. Let's get real, my friend. So I always love in these to make an, a, you know, Marvel and all those other movies. They have origin tales, like you have the Wolverine origin tale. Okay, I want the Hartej origin tale. All right, I don't want just your current opinions. We'll get to those. But tell us about you. You know, where are you from? What's your educational background? What's your work background? And when and how did you have your crypto epiphany? And what did that look like for you? So I'm, and just for just final disclaimer, I interrupt a lot, just so you know. And that's because I'm interested. Okay. When if I interrupt, I'm interested. So just take in that light. But go ahead. Cool. I will try to be as brief slash detailed as possible. So Hey, everybody. My name is Hertheid Sani. I was born and raised in central New Jersey in Princeton. I, uh, I'm, the, I'm the first generation American uh, son of two Indian immigrants who moved to America in the, the late 1970s, early 1980s. And uh, I went to high school right in the middle of that sentence. I got an incoming telegram call. 
Uh, sorry about that. So I kill your telegram. Be with us in a very Zen Buddhist way. Kill your telegram. It's okay. All, all the all, all all the clients will still be there when you get back. As he chats them. <laughs> I love my friends. And yeah. yeah. Oh, um, I, gr I grew up in central New Jersey, went to high school there, Western New Plainsboro High School South. For anybody who's watching and knows what that is, it's one of the in the whole country. Uh, extremely diverse. I grew up in an area where looking the way I do with a turban and beard as a sick American, I had absolutely no troubles growing up. Uh, extremely diverse uh, area, very welcoming. Um, one of the best places to be raised. And, mm -hmm. you know, I, I'm grateful to my parents for pursuing the American dream. And um, yeah, I'm really grateful for everything that they provided me. I went to college at Penn State. I studied finance. I thought I was going to become an iBanker. After doing two summers on Wall Street, I realized it was not for me. I did. Uh, I worked at an investment banking boutique, uh, and I worked on at TD Securities. And I realized that this is just all not for me. Um, but I've always just been a hustler. The truth is, I'm an entrepreneur, and uh, running small hustles never. Uh, it was never taught to me that that should be valued. I just thought it was a side thing. And so throughout college, I was um, custom printing clothing for frats and sororities and clubs, mm -hmm. and I was supporting myself, paying my own rent and paying for my own alcohol and paying for my own food um, because my parents were uh, so gracious to pay for my actual tuition. Um, I, I, I had to cover everything else. And uh, I started my little business. I was custom printing clothing and I started navigating all kinds of, of waters, of hustles. And um, after graduating, I I, instead of going to Wall Street, mm -hmm. I actually opened up a food truck uh, if you're if you're in New York City, there's a really famous food truck called 53rd and 6th. Uh, they call them the chicken rice guys. Now they're called mm -hmm. the halal guys. It's become official. Yes. Right? Yeah, uh, yeah, back I've seen it. Day, when we were kids, it was not official. It was just these two brothers that had trucks on 53rd and 6th in New York. Mm -hmm. And uh, that concept didn't exist at Penn State. You used to eat cardboard pizza for a dollar. And my college roommate, Sonny Shakawala, shout out if he watches this. Mm -hmm. uh, my college, he was also a finance major and him and I, basically lost our job offers just weeks before graduating. So I had a job oh, no. offer to become a banker on Wall mm -hmm. Street. Um, I didn't get my signing bonus. It got taken away from me. Um, and uh, I ended up opening up this dope business with my roommate. We opened up a food truck, found a loophole to be the only food truck at Penn State and uh, crushed it for about eight months. And then after that, I moved home to take care of my dad who had brain cancer. Mm -hmm. And uh, I became his home nurse for two years. And it was during that time I took a turn to work remotely for a tech startup in a, in the Silicon Valley. Let, let me pause you for a second because I, I thought I, I saw you posted that about that online and yeah, you know, I, I just you know I can relate. My dad died of cancer when I was twelve, so I saw that. I was like, wow, you went home and you took care of him for two years. Yeah, I, so I, I I took care of him. It was my honor. I'm grateful, and I got to spend some quality time with my pops. And my older brother and my mom were able to go to work, and I. It was a, such a beautiful time. I was able to take care of him, uh, start teaching myself how to code, uh, a little mm -hmm. bit of Python, um, Python, a little bit of Ruby, and mm -hmm. a little bit of Java. Just started like familiarize myself. I was working for a tech startup in the Valley called Pixatel. Mm -hmm. um, they were in ed tech. I realized that I am capable of building my own company without getting an MBA. Um, you know, my Indian American parents uh, were pretty rough and hard on the sense that they're like, you got to become an engineer, lawyer, doctor at the bare minimum. You got to get a master's degree or else you're not, you're not a qualified adult in, in mm -hmm. society. Um, and this is the kind of stuff I was fed. So I was fully intent on going to get my master's degree or get an MBA. Uh, and instead I ended up starting my first startup and I applied to a bunch of startup accelerators and I ended up getting into one just 24 hours after my father passed away. Oh my God. And it was called Startup Chile. And so, I mean- Maybe he was looking down from, from heaven and he said, I, I, I'll, I'll grace you guys with my presence, but see my son down in there, take care of him now. Look, I, I thought of it as a blessing. It was also mm -hmm. a blessing that my father no longer had to suffer. So mm -hmm. he, he, he went, he passed on. Yep. And uh, <clears throat> I started my first startup called Zeldi and I got $40,000 equity free from the Chilean government to move down to Chile. Mm -hmm. I went. I started a startup. It was a mobile point of sale system integrating to legacy point of sale systems like micros. So we re-engineered the micros POS from 
restaurants to work on any tablet, Android or iOS, mm -hmm. uh, and, and included mobile payments. And in the middle of that, uh, after that program, we moved to, we moved to Las Vegas. We, as in me and my, my co-founder, Gal Dolber, an Israeli Argentine, born in Argentina, or born in Israel, but really more Argentine, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, excellent world-class engineer who built everything in a functional programming language called Clojure. Yeah. Uh, he became, he got me really familiar to the power of functional programming. Oh. And I went on travel. 2013 went down this hardcore rabbit hole of Bitcoin and I ended up talking to more of my friends about Bitcoin than I did about anything to do with mobile point of sale or traditional fintech and pretty much everyone I knew said you should probably focus more on Bitcoin and get into the space because it's all you talk about and um, when we moved to Vegas I had actually started uh, with a couple of friends organizing the Las Vegas crypto meetup um, mm -hmm. It already been going running. I didn't start it, but it like shut down and died. And so we kind of gave it rebirth um, and uh, we, we kept it alive. And that's just kind of how Vegas is a, a unique place. And I'm really proud of the Vegas tech community there and uh, all the support that they gave us. Uh, when Ethereum happened, I got a call from my friend, Yo Sub Kwan and uh, a friend, a group of friends, including Yo, had been making investments in ICOs, and they realized that a lot of these ICO smart contracts have blatant critical vulnerabilities in them. Right. And, and Yo Kwan said, "Listen, like, you're one of the best networked hustlers I know, and you understand crypto. Um, we want to audit smart contracts, and we want you to run like the business, and we're gonna audit code." Um, this is needed. And like, you know, we went down this rabbit hole and realized at that time only consensus diligence and mm -hmm. Zeppelin was auditing smart contracts. And um, I, can I ask you a question? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to display my ignorance. Is Zeppelin a company? I thought they were, they published the tools for auditing. Did they actually audit it themselves or am they I were, mistaken? They were actually auditing themselves and they still are. Um, but they, showed that they were focusing on their own ICO and their own platform. And they mm -hmm. weren't just, they weren't just in a focused auditing shop and consensus, as you know, has a lot of people doing a lot of different things. Diligence was just one of their arms and it still is one of their arms and they're still one of our partners and we take their overflow if they reach capacity. Um, and so we started Hosho, which was a smart contract auditing firm. We, grew really fast. We did 14 million in revenue in the, sorry, 4 million in revenue in the first 14 months. Uh, can't slip that up. So for, yeah, we did 4 million in revenue in the first 14. Well, your, your next one will do 14 million in four months. You know, you, you gotta, you gotta get and there. <laughs> we, grew, we grew to 37 people with majority American employees. And mm -hmm. that was a, a not sustainable um, staff and salary model and growth model um, when crypto winter hit. And we weren't able to sustain ourselves. And so um, I ended up- let, let me jump in for one second. I, I, I knew you when that was happening and I know you, you were under just a ton of stress and yeah. you kind of- I was on the front page of Coindesk with my red turban and it says, smart contract auditor has laid off 80% of staff. No, I, I remember. And you know, you and I were talking, I, I remember you shared your stress, but you were, and you, you kind of went, uh, not underground, but I, th I think you did a period of, of introspection and it's nice to see you here in the end of 2020 rocking and rolling. You know, you, you can't keep a good man down. It's, it's It speaks to your character that you like, bounce back and you, you're doing stuff. Can't get rid of me. <laughs> yeah, you know, I've tried to be honest, but so I gave up. <laughs> but anyways, you know, go, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, and uh, after that, you know, I, my wife is Ukrainian. We moved to Kiev, she was pregnant. And we already, I was able to retain a part of my previous team at Hosho and basically completely rebuilt Hosho into Zokyo and part, ended up partnering up with the right people here in Kiev and hiring aggressively uh, over the course of the last year and a half to build out um, basically our own blockchain development, blockchain mm -hmm. security and blockchain studio. And so we are both doing de hardcore development we're doing we're doing smart contract audits and pen testing and we're also running a studio and simultaneously i'm the chief marketing and business development officer for a really exciting company based out of london called credo mm -hmm. so i'm wearing uh 
I'm wearing two turbans, Gordon. Ah, uh, two turbans. I got it. But I, I, I think, I think I saw on the Zokio website that it's the the entities are related. Is is that true? Uh, it's, it's just. I'm just saying. I'm just trying to remind everyone that this used to be Hosho. Now it's yes. Zokio. Okay, but it, it sounds like Hosho with a bigger mandate. It, it, you, you, it's not just. It's definitely Ethereum. a lot. We're we're not Ethereum. Uh, we are blockchain agnostic. We don't just focus on Ethereum. We are oh, we're, very we're... aggressively world class and training world class blockchain. Oh, we got a little. Are we okay? Yeah, we're okay. Yeah, we're, we're we uh, have a. Yeah, we have a good heartbeat of what it takes to hire blockchain engineering and security talent. And people are not talking enough about the global shortage of quality blockchain security talent, um, which is even greater than blockchain engineering talent. Um, it's very hard. Yeah, actually, you know, I'm sorry, let me stop you a second. We actually have some fantastic alumni speakers on. I'm going to change the order that we normally do this. We normally talk to the guests for like an hour and then bring in the alumni speakers. But I... You know, everyone's got busy schedules and I don't necessarily want to lose them and you know some of them. So yeah. I, I, th I think I want to... I know Pedro. Yep. Um, let's see, James, are you able to join in? And I'll, I'll get to Pedro and Austin, everyone else. We've got Austin Davis, the legend. Yeah, no, we got great people. We're both advisors to Casper Labs. Shout out Casper Labs. Well, that, that, that's... Without going, without going into details, that's kind of how we all met. Or not how we all met, but that's how a couple of people and I met on the show here. Um, James, I'm gonna give you. A, we got Bitcoin Kalesi. I love it. Wow. We got the. Okay, you know whoever talks first. So Austin, Pedro, uh, Mayor, Mayor Upper Roop. Yeah, Mayor. Hola, ho show. Is that Pedro? Pedro, turn on your video so I can see your smiling face. People. Hey, what's going on? What's going on, servant people? What's up with you, my brother? How are you at? Yo, yo, yo. Yeah, yeah. I, I love it. We got yeah. Puerto Rico to so Kiev. Where are you? You in Kiev? I'm in Kiev for the winter. Yeah. Let's see where I end up in a few months. Are you like, are you like living there like full time now? Like at least half a year? No. Yeah. Half a year where I'm, I've been living here. We really great. We built out a really sizable team here and it's nice to uh, just be heads down. People do more work in bad weather. Yes. Oh man, listen, Kiev has tremendous Kiev Kharkiv too, I'm sure you're aware. Oh, yeah. Um but, you know, like Ukraine in general, that whole area is filled with developer talent and they have a great work ethic. They they they're um, you know, I don't want to talk too much about their salaries. Their salaries are a lot lower than Americans for sure. But even better than that, their work ethic is incredible. They work six days a week, twelve hours a day generally. It's very normal in their culture. Yep. Um, and you know, I, I've had a ton of success working with Ukrainian developers and also to uh, social media, I would imagine, uh, hard edge would be something you should look into social media content and content writers. Cause Ukrainians generally, their accent is a little bit tough, but writing English, they're very educated, especially younger Ukrainians. So, um, I was actually building a social media team there when I was there. Um, and I spent, you know, I, I ended up getting my passport stolen <laughs> in oh, Kiev. So I ended up staying there a little bit longer than I intended to. But I had a blast there. Man. And, you know, Kiev is one of the most beautiful cities I was unexpected uh, uh, to be so beautiful in my, in my life. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I think it's unexpected because not a lot of Hollywood movies and commercials have been shot here. But truth is, people don't realize that most of the new commercials, especially, especially the big European companies, most of the new ones are shot in Kiev, but people don't realize it. All the new BMW commercials, all the new Audi commercials are shot in Kiev. And uh, I have a lot of experience working with both Ukrainian and Indian engineers. And I'll tell you, uh, um, I've, had ex I've had amazing experiences in both, but um, it, it, is it, it takes a little bit less handholding and I've had a lot more reliability for blockchain engineers specifically in Ukraine. And I've had an excellent experience with penetration testing specifically in Bangalore with our partners there and people and, and, and employees that work with us. Um, and you're right, the work ethic is really high here and COVID has accelerated the world realizing yes. that it doesn't matter where you are. And if you know a CTO here is just like a CTO there. And it doesn't matter where here or there is, uh, they read the same books and they know the same things if they're a good full stack engineer. Um, and then it comes down to kind of cost of 
quality of uh, cost of local expenses, right? Like quality of life in Kiev is super high and you don't really need Amazing. to make that much to live a very high quality life. We were just making a joke when I got on the show that I, I ride around in an Uber black for around seven or eight bucks. And, uh, you know, uh, that's kind of, usually I'd be kind of a, a cocky guy for saying I'm riding around in Uber black in Kiev. It's like, no, nah, I'll take Uber black. <laughs> no questions asked. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Sorry. Let me jump on one second. So Artesh, you, you mentioned something that was actually on our invitation, which is one of our talking points and Pedro stay with us. But, um, one of our talking points was working, building global businesses post COVID. And you kind of alluded to that just now, like COVID sort of accelerated this development. Can you dive into that and kind of go into what you mean? Yeah, so what I want to say about that is that we have a clear formula. Hold on. It says my internet connection is unstable. Let me just- No, you're fine, bro. You're fine. So basically, <laughs> Move those books. That'll solve it. Uh, Marco, you got, you got to mute yourself. Oh yeah, that's it. Oh, there you go. I, I thought that was your wife. Move the books. Move yourself. That's definitely gonna help you yeah. that connection. I think. Hey guys, I just I just wanted to say a quick quick hello. I gotta I gotta jump off to another thing, but I I heard you call me out earlier and I couldn't couldn't chat. I'll jump on camera real quick. Hey Austin, good What's to see up, you. Oh, come back hey, if you to, can. We, I we will. I will. But- Good to see you too. And Hartej, you came up recently. I actually dropped a message. I forgot how, but of course we're talking about auditing smart contracts and you were the first person that came to mind. So Gordon was like, reach out on the, uh, on the thread. And then of course you said, of course I'm still doing it. So it's good to hear the progression of uh, Hosho to Zokyo and all of your amazing stories. So, uh, so l- 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 let me encourage everyone in the alumni chat that's that there for a yeah. reason to connect with each other. Okay, this is a nonprofit yeah. community serving venture. We're, no one's asking for a cut. Just, just make it happen. I want, I want crypto to succeed. So I like connecting yeah, with people. Okay, yeah. so just, just do it. We have to be more aggressive about staying in touch with each other now post COVID. I used to yeah. kind of finish in between conferences, just knowing that it's only going to be two or three weeks before I'm back at a conference and I see everybody again. Uh, this is the longest I've gone without seeing all of you. And so now I'm waking up and thinking, all right, maybe I need to put an hour on my calendar to like actually consciously thinking about connecting with someone who I normally don't uh, and have an actual Zoom call. Super well, l- 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 let me jump in. So we, we're lucky enough to have two, we have many good people on this, but we have Sergey and we have Pedro. Okay, Sergey is running like nonstop shows in Russia and with Russian speakers, so Ukraine, Belarus, everywhere else. Great network to tap into. And he's, I think everyone should be guessing on his show also. Pedro is leading Crypto Mondays in Puerto Rico and is doing a bang up job. And so I, there's a lot of cross germination <laughs> that can happen. They've been nice enough to have me on their shows and they're coming on my show. So this is, you know, we can have this sort of ongoing virtual conference and networking thing by linking these all together. So I wanna give appreciation to those two individuals. And Austin, if you, I'm happy to, you know, Austin was a guest, you know, and actually formed a panel uh, a couple ago and, you know, I did a bang up job. So just, you know, blessings to you. My that friend. was a lot of fun. We'll, we'll do it again soon. Yes, For totally. Being a crypto company, I think that it's important to think about ex-CIS countries. So Russian speaking countries yes. have the highest adoption of crypto in the world. And it is um, due to the language barrier, it's going overlooked and only Binance and a handful of Asian exchanges have started to take advantage of it and hire people here. Um, for you know communities like layer one protocols and layer twos that are starting to start growing their communities, my advice to them is to really hone in on the Eastern European XCIS market. Um, and if you want help navigating those waters, contact me. Well, I, I got a question because I, I always wonder whether they refer to them as Russian speaking CIS or XCIS. You seem to- X. X. Okay, fair enough. Gordon, let's let's get James into the conversation because I think James is yeah. still a couple of minutes left before he needs to drop Yeah, on. yeah, and, and then Marco also. Uh, but James, James Haft, ladies and gentlemen, James Haft. James Haft, join in, my friend, if you can. He, he would like to- camera on, James. Camera on. I'll be listening in when I can, guys. But I do have to jump too. As okay, well. awesome. Great, see, great seeing you. Martez, good to see you, Gordon. Great to see you. Everybody else as well. We'll talk soon. Yep. All right. Well, when, the moment James brings up, we'll get him in here. But just, just. Oh, there he is, James. 
Okay, okay, I'm, I came back. Okay, sorry. So I have five minutes. I apologize. Hartez, I just wanted to say hello. I'll give you a hug. Hey, man, virtual hugs. Virtual hugs. Man. You're the easiest man to find at a conference. I am. Yes. <laughs> yeah, he, it's a beacon, man. <laughs> it's a beacon, and there's other characteristics. So, so I'm, glad I'm, you I'm usually, I'm usually not difficult to spot either, man. I'm six four. That's, that's, that's true. That's true. That's true. We got a, got a, got a great, great group on here, Gordon. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, and Hart, Hartej, I'm really proud of you, the way that you, you, you've moved over and, you know, you got through the, the whole show breakup. Uh, and I think it's really exciting where you've positioned yourself because I think it's right in the sweet spot of what's going to happen over the next two, three years. Yeah, yeah. Thank so, you. Do, I really do, appreciate do, that. Um, just, Sorry, go ahead. Older men, it's great. It's great to have mentors. I'm just grateful to have mentors and brothers like you. Thanks so much for everything, Thank James. Thank you so much. So I gotta, I gotta run, but let's catch up soon. And, and I, I miss you, and and I'm and and I'm looking forward to work with you, buddy. All let's right. Talk, let's, let's talk to the end of this week, hopefully. Perfect. And thank, thank you, Gordon. Bye, bye. My pleasure. Okay, Artez, Ar Ar I, I, I am, I am gonna nail this point though. So working and building businesses post COVID, talk. So India and Ukraine have the best engineers in the world, in my opinion, as, as do several ex-CIS countries, but my personal familiarity is with mm -hmm. Ukraine and India. So I can only speak about where I am familiar. And Ukraine and India are two very special places. And so if someone were to give me an unlimited budget mm -hmm. and were to say, okay, you have a billion dollar budget, build the company of the future and build a billion dollar business. I wanna be your early stage investor. My formula is hire your engineers and build out your team First of all, you need a, a great CTO that speaks both English and Russian and, uh, <laughs> and that you trust. And that would be amazing. And uh, build out your team in Eastern Europe. Um, and same thing would go if you're focused on doing it in India. Well, you need to start with having a trusted Indian CTO who wants to live in India and be around the engineers physically. Uh, it's very important. Um, and then we, we, we explain why that is. I mean, besides the obvious things like time difference in language, but maybe that may or if that's it, it let me know. Um, there's a, a long list of things. But we'll, I, I'll start with one of the curveballs. The curveball in India is building a culture is a little bit more difficult than building a culture in Ukraine. And that is due to religious and cultural differences amongst people in India. There's more diversity in religion and and income class and background, building a culture can be trickier. Earning trust and knowing their backgrounds and vetting people can be a little trickier compared to Ukraine, where there's a lack of diversity. Mm -hmm. There used to be an, there was an iron curtain here not that long ago. People didn't travel, leave, people didn't even travel within districts and they still don't travel that much, right. thin districts. So there's a, a, due to the lack of diversity, building a company culture here is actually easier. And, uh, on that note, take the top 25 startups in Israel. Every single one has an engineering team in, the, in Ukraine. Hmm. And, and the majority of them, I don't know the facts on the other side, but majority of them have a, a biz dev operation out of New York City or London or one of these English speaking, more expensive places. And so, yeah, that I, this is the, the model where things are heading, even at Credo, the majority of our engineering team is in Belarus and the um, biz dev and marketing team is mostly based out of London. And uh, well, and now post COVID, everybody's hiding somewhere in some cabin in the mountains, but. <laughs> well, I, I, actually, I was gonna nail that point. So is, is what you just said, was it true before COVID? Has it become more true post COVID? Like how has how COVID, COVID specifically uh, impacted this model? We're at a point where you, you need software to get written and get written properly. Who cares if this person's in, person's in Ukraine, Colombia, New Zealand, Australia, it doesn't matter. What matters is trust and time zone. And as long as your time zones coordinate enough for your relationship to work and you can build trust and you can align on cost, mm -hmm. let it go. And I, and, and I feel like post COVID, in increasing number of people who may have been a little bit close-minded to outstaffed or outsourced development, or right. maybe working with someone in Ukraine because they're not familiar with Ukraine. Maybe they think that it's still a part of Russia and they have never visited and they're ignorant. 
Uh, people have all kinds of hesitations towards working with people outsource. And truth is Silicon Valley's tier one VCs continue to encourage people to build in-house engineering teams. And they give their, and they give their portfolio. Um, for a lot of tier one VCs, that investment thesis has treated them well. And they have a right to continue to invest with what thesis has worked for them. And so I can't disrespect big tier one VCs, but a growing- Wait, wait a second, it, it, it has worked and do you think will continue to work for them or has worked, but there's a pivot that will even affect them? Peter Thiel said that he lost, he, the PayPal culture got um, drastically affected when they just had a second floor of the office. That's how passionate thing and build in one office. Now I'd be curious today to know, I'd be curious today to know what Peter Thiel's opinion is post COVID. But I know for a fact, this was Peter Thiel's founders fund investment thesis. I've pitched them myself in my previous startup. And we had an issue with the fact that my co-founder was in, uh, splitting his time between Las Vegas and Argentina. Um, I mean, to me, to me one, one floor sounds like an infection chamber. Like, yeah. I don't want to be one floor with people. Like, get the, get the, get the hell away from me. <laughs> yeah, but they achieve success. And I'll tell you, I'm not ready for my team to be 100% fully remote. And even as someone who's in favor of remote working, mm -hmm. it's nice for certain members of the team, especially core engineering team members, it's really great for them to be able to get together in one room one day a week. You know, it's I, I, I agree. So let, let me let me ask you, white boy. You know, I, 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 again, I'm gonna flip back and forth. I, I feel like Marco should and wants to jump in here. Marco is a very smart guy. I'm working with him on a couple of projects. Just good person, very intelligent, is and is always on these shows. And now he's asking pointed questions. And in fact, was not you know put together a fantastic panel on digital identity for us. So Marco, if you can spare us a couple of minutes and share some thoughts and share some questions, that'd be that'd be great. Go for it. Go. Uh, <clears throat> wow, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Oh, good, okay. Uh, I have, uh, I'm in a similar internet scenario to Hartej there. <laughs> still still quasi third world. Um, so questions, the, uh, thoughts. One of the things I wanna just quickly check. Yeah, I just wanna check in with you, Hartej. Uh, Kiev, uh, I spent about six weeks there about five years ago. Uh, working with a local uh, dev shop uh, currently known as Star. You may know them. Uh, they're a huge outsourcing shop based in Kiev. Okay. And one, one of the things I, when I was effectively living there for that period uh, that I found was walking around Kiev is uh, a lot like walking around Cairo and then turning a corner and finding yourself in Paris. Well, what does that mean? Have you been yeah, to Mar 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 Marco, I, I hear you laughing, but I, I don't hear the questions or the comments. Uh, I think he's got an internet issue. It's you didn't okay. hear the question. Well, I, I, I heard some observation that's like Cairo, and then I heard a bunch of laughter, but I, I didn't hear a question. Or... Oh, boy. Internet... Okay. You know what? Maybe what I should do is I should just... Uh... My internet's wonky. I'm going to uh, reconnect with my dial-in. So go on to something else, and I'll be back. Fine. Mayor, can, can we bring you into this? Meher. Meher, I'm sorry. I don't know if I've ever actually had a moment to be corrected on that. Meher. I'll tell you what, we, along, my, along my speakers, when you get a moment to unmute yourself, I'm kind of playing jazz with this one. So, Artez, we'll go to your next scheduled topic until one of them gets their internet straight. So security in the crypto space, how, how did you, you, you kind of gave the background with Hosho and everything else and how these gentlemen spoke to you. The, wh wh what did you see then? And what are you seeing now in terms of security in the crypto space? Was, you know, smart contract auditing, pen testing and, and the like. The biggest thing we're seeing is that you have a lot of engineers that have been engineers in the past, but never hacked in Solidity that now taught themselves Solidity over the last few months to build a DeFi project. And the security on those projects that we're looking at 
needs significant so, work. And when people are coming to us for a smart contract audit um, written by one of these types of engineers that just taught themselves solidity, we can just be the auditor because that would mean that we are writing custom automated tools for a smart contract that's gonna remain as is. So we end up doing a manual audit, going back to them and saying, okay, we gotta, we think you should change a lot of things and rewrite the functions and you'll save a lot of gas fees doing it this way. And there could be a vulnerability that way. And like- Right, uh, so I'm, I'm doing my interrupting because I'm interested in thing. So you, you just made a comment that's beyond security. You made an efficiency or best practice comment there with the gas fees. Yeah, so mm -hmm. it's a lot more than security. We're, we're doing a lot more than just security. We're making things better for the community, for everybody. This is a community thing, an investor thing, a government thing. We're making sure this is prepared to be listed on digital asset exchanges, both DEX and, and do we call it SEX, DEX and KEX. <laughs> uh, and- uh, Oh, it's a Russian <laughs> C, yeah, kind of. <laughs> Anyways, uh, and- we are holding the hands of these teams in a way that I'm not sure many have the capacity to do in this space at the moment. Uh, and I don't know how other auditing teams are operating because there's such high capacity. Um, but, you know, people are, people are at their bandwidth. A lot of the top auditing firms um, have a two, three month wait time now to get in there and um, a lot of teams are giving us code to audit without writing their own test suites. Mm -hmm. You can't ship, you can't ship open source code without being able to run that code and open up the test environment. We as an auditor cannot be writing your test suites for you. Um, and we are seeing teams come to us with a deadline of one, two weeks, and we have to help them fundamentally first take a step back and say, you got to write your test suites. Now, um, do, do they, do they know that and they are not doing it or is it just that they don't know? It's a mix of things. Sometimes they don't know. Sometimes they know, but they were in a rush and they were hoping that we would do it. And, um, and on the other hand, we are also seeing teams come to us as the third auditor. This is the, this is the first time since we started Ho Show that we have the largest number of coming to us as the third and fourth auditor that are very sophisticated teams that are super, super nervous about deploying the smart contract. And they're coming to us as a third or fourth auditor before launching the TGE. And at the same time, I have also the largest number of, I would say more immature approach where they want to get an audit after TGE, after oh, the token starting at a bunch of exchanges. This is true for most yield farms in DeFi. Most of them are going live with unaudited code for the first two weeks or the first 100,000 blocks. And that's where, that's where you make most of the money in these yield farms, the first 100,000 blocks or so, the first two weeks. And that's unaudited code. So we're being hired by investment shops to audit code of yield farms that are unaudited just for the investment shop. So you, you so let me repeat back, back, back to you. It's not even the developer of the code that's asking you to audit. It's a third party that has a stake or interest in what this thing is. Mm -hmm. That's interesting, but that can also make for a lot of redundancy because 50 different investment houses can hire 50 different auditors. That's a huge duplication of effort potentially. Yes. The more the merrier because every time we're finding stuff and the, the well, more key, the merrier if it gets back to the original source and they fix it. They have to fix it, yes. But the key is we need more quality engineers to sit down and think about the logic flaws and to think like a black hat and to think about how you can exploit this contract because it may not be a typical security flaw that this is going to pick up. It's not, or it's not going to be picked up by automated tooling. You need someone who deeply understands cybersecurity with a quality assurance mindset and really understands the language that this is written in, which right now it continues to be Solidity. And, you know, we, we're trying to groom Solidity experts and Solidity, Solidity pros who have to keep up with this rapidly moving and rapidly evolving industry. Well, so let me ask another question. Is Solidity up to the task in its current form? Or is there perhaps a flaw in the language or a shortcoming in the language itself? I'm less concerned about the language than I am quality of engineers at the moment. In the past, we've observed some flaws in Solidity, but it just keeps getting better and better and better because 
it's such a powerful developer community. It is the biggest developer community of any blockchain today. Hmm. And, okay, and, and then how does someone, Go ahead. Is, it, is this something that someone can even learn solo or, or must they work with others and get hands-on experience in a group? Like how, how do you actually transition over being security-minded, quality-minded with, with this? Start building. But the thing is the best people that are good at security in this space have mm -hmm. a security background where they were actually doing stuff with quality assurance in the past. They were yes. actually going for bug bounties at, on, on bug bounty. They, they have earned big bugs on bug bounties and they're right. actual hackers. And they went to DEF CON, not only Ethereum DEF CON, but they've been to DEF CON. And I got it. <laughs> you know, and like uh, we need- And they own the feds. Yeah, we need more people from DEF CON to be incentivized to be in this and protect this industry. Um, that puts, we need more people to be poached from the DEF CON community to come into crypto. Every major exchange should have a couple of DEF CON hackers just in-house on the payroll. They have the money. Same with layer ones, same with layer twos, same with OTC desks. They mm -hmm. all have the money. Hire hackers, hire CISOs. Don't wait for government regulations to tell you that you have to get a penetration test and that you have to check for data leaks in your cloud services. Everybody in our space is using Amazon Web Services, Azure, or Google Cloud. Mm -hmm. There can be leaks in your data in your cloud services. It's super normal practice in fintech and healthcare to look for leaks in your cloud services. But due to a lack of uh, know-how or private... Um, I, I would say private regulation. Like, you know, we don't have like a PCI compliance, which is not a government mandated thing. Um, well, it, 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 sorry. And, and there's also so much, like you said, the, the fact that you make most of your money in the first 100,000 blocks, plus I'll add in there, there's a lot of similar projects coming out. There's economic incentives to move fast and fix it later. And yeah. it's, that's kind of the nature of the market right now. I, I don't know that it's, it's, you know, like everything else in life, it's, it's both a good thing and a bad thing. Um, we had some big ones today. Every day there's rug pulls because of this. And that's not a good look. And we don't want to see more class action lawsuits pop up, in, especially in the United States. No. That's going to cause a big ruckus. If we have a bunch of class action lawsuits because of DeFi, and you got people standing outside. Remember, you remember the guy outside of Consensus in New York? Oh, yeah. The posters. I forget what it was. Like, give me back my Tezos or something like that. I forgot what it was. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Some, some, something like but, that. But uh, you know, it's funny. I, I do remember that actually. I do, and I talked to him, and yeah, I think you're right. And you know, it's funny. Here we are, like a couple of years later, and that made an impression. Yeah, that could be a class action lawsuit, and that's when the feds get pissed off when thousands or hundreds or dozens even of American citizens start filing class action lawsuits. And I mean, I hate to, I hate to bring up America, America, America over and over because in crypto, to me, this is a human thing. This is a global thing. This is beyond passports. But we got to navigate the current system, and America has a lot of power as the world's reserve currency, and the SEC uh, flexes its power across borders at the moment. And for better for worse, I'm in Studio City, California, so I, I, I'm not like a hard, hard target to reach right now. The, are, are there are there best practices or templates or models that can currently be implemented in Solidity? Is there a growing like you know consensus about this is how it should be done, or is it all we're at a point today where Trail of Bits and Quantstamp and Certic and ourselves, we've all released so much material on how to properly write smart contracts and to prepare for your smart contract audit. Uh, we need people to just follow those templates, follow the rules, have enough lead time, tell your investors in advance that you're going to need a budget for auditing and pen testing and for looking for data leaks in your cloud services and for hiring an in-house security person to think about your in-house security practices. Mm -hmm. And it's ha I'm happy to, happy to uh, frighten people and remind them that if you are in the crypto space, you are a target of hackers. Yep, and big time. Even if you're an employee at a big company and you feel like you're a nobody because you, you're employee number 150 at Coin, Coinbase, um, guess what? You're a target. Yep. It's, it's, it's true. Um, 
And then what, what the, what the one, one thing you mentioned in sort of our pre-talk, or you know, you, you, you seem to have a special affinity or interest in atomic swaps. I do. Uh, you know, at Credo, we launched cross-chain atomic swaps, institutional grade cross-chain atomic swaps. So you can swap. No, between... no, 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 let me jump in. I'm going to do my standard line, which is talk to me like I'm five. Okay. So explain to a five-year-old atomic swaps and why they're cool. Yeah. So fundamentally, you know, interoperability between Bitcoin and Ethereum hasn't really been there. Uh, you know, Bitcoin is decentralized. Ethereum is decentralized. But when it comes to both of them interacting with each other, most interoperability solutions are centralized. And, uh, you know, m most developers are working on the, you know, when they're working on uh, Ethereum dApps or the Bitcoin protocol, uh, very little has been achieved at, at these two networks. And so, you know, like today, if I want to swap my Bitcoin for Ethereum, I'm going to move my Bitcoin onto a centralized exchange mm -hmm. and swap them, sell them for Ethereum. I'm giving custody of my coins to a centralized exchange and trusting this exchange. This is, this process is cumbersome and uh, against the Satoshi vision of not your keys, not your crypto, right? Um, and in interoperability can be achieved today through wrapped solutions. So we've seen wrapped Bitcoin really pick up dominance in the space so fast. Okay, so like I'm five, explain wrapped Bitcoin. I'm about to tell you. Love wrapped, you, baby. <laughs> wrapped Bitcoin is basically um, an ERC-20 token representing the price of Bitcoin. So you're able to spend your Bitcoin on Ethereum and get exposure into things like DeFi. Um, the problem is that it's still centralized. Wrapped Bitcoin is backed by BitGo and other and decentralized solutions, um, centralized custodians. Um, I'm not saying they're going to disappear overnight, but now we have an alternate. And Credo has released something really, pretty, pretty revolutionary, right? Because mm. you need governance controls when you're able to do institutional grade atomic swaps. So if I'm Goldman Sachs and I want to swap between Bitcoin to Ethereum, I'm not going to, I'm not going to use MetaMask. I'm not going to just use some decentralized exchange and I'm not going to use a centralized exchange that's domiciled in the Cayman Islands or uh, Malta or some other random jurisdiction. It's not going to work for Goldman Sachs. And it's not going to work for even a family office that wants to do large OTC transactions. So, um, yeah, uh, this Credo's approach to atomic swaps uses what's called multi-party computation. So I'm going to break that down like you're five. So uh, if you really want me to basically yes. multi-party computation like you're five. Mm -hmm. Okay. Bob, oh, wait, yeah, I, I, Einstein said, if you can sp explain something as simply as necessary, but no simpler, you know it. So now, 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 now you're on. Pamela and Bill are going to go on a date and they want to decide after that first date, if they're going to go on a second date. And after the first date, they're both anonymously going to submit an answer to say, would you like to go on another date or not? Mm -hmm. And if they both say yes, then they want to know if the answer was yes from both parties. And if they both, if one of them says no and one of them says yes, then you can't have exposure. That would be rude. Uh, this is a fundamental kind of basic concept of anonymous multi-party computation, mm -hmm. where you can, we're trying to hide your private keys. We're trying to make it so there are no private keys. There is a anonymous public private key set. So in, in, in crypto, MPC is used so that you can be using a system where an anonymous public private key represents your crypto. You're never exposing your private key. There is no private key. I'll give you one more like dumbed down MPC example. You're at a table with a couple of friends having dinner and you want to figure out how much everybody earns in their salary. And um, basically everybody submits anonymously how much they earn, but there's rules to this in the sense that you can't collude with Gordon sitting next to you and sub at tell each other how much you earn and how much he earns or else you might be able to do the math on how much everybody else actually earns. Mm -hmm. 
NPC can sit in the middle to do what seem use cryptography, which seems like magic, to calculate how much this group earns without exposing the truth of who earns how much from each individual. Um, there's some really great Technion University in Israel mm -hmm. has some really nice uh, videos on multi-party computation. And there's a, lot of, there's a lot of companies in the crypto space like Curve and Fireblocks that are taking a stab at leveraging, mul uh, leveraging multi-party computation in, in an array of ways. But uh, Credo has taken their own approach and really trying to focus on what would it, what does it look like for us getting family offices to adopt digital assets? The, the target market for Credo's in atomic swaps, it's not the average degenerate Chad who wants to log in a Uniswap with MetaMask and do trades. Did you just go like outright red pill jargon? And if so, I love you. <laughs> degenerate Chad, I love it. Um, how, how did the idea first show up for Guido? Brian Spector is the co-founder with Anthony Foy, and he has a cryptography background. And we have four PhDs in cryptography on the team. Wow. So for these people, when you say crypto, they're not thinking about cryptocurrency. They first think about cryptography. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, most of the team worked together on a previous company called Miracle, which exited. And so all those cryptography guys under Brian Spector came over. And so, yeah, Credo's network is backed by custom HSM chips on, and it's built on a fork of Tendermint. Um, and so they have a, a governance token coming out and the network is actually backed by physical data centers scattered throughout the world. So it's not Amazon Web Services. It can't just be turned off by Jeff Bezos. Um, this oh, wait, is wait, wait, sorry, that, that, that's brilliant. If I understand you correctly, that's brilliant. So the family offices, it's almost like a private OTC network. Yes, that is correct. And, and it's almost like a, it's almost like a private, it's almost like a little NASDAQ. Yep. It's a, it's a, a dark pool. It's a liquidity pool. It's a, mm. uh, right. We solve the liquidity problem in the space. The more people that join the network, the more peer to peer transactions that you can conduct. Uh, you know, you can do things like pooling money together instead of trusting just one person. You, you're leveraging the, you're leveraging the full power of smart contracts with governance controls, with the ability to bring your governance rules uh, into the into the system um, and have self custody of your wallet. Um, yeah, that's pretty deep. So pretty, how, pretty... How, how far along is this? It's live. Uh, atomic swaps are live. So go to credo.com Q R E D O. We have a lot of tweets that have come out a lot of LinkedIn uh, content that we've been putting out about our atomic swaps about how they work. So check out Credo's Credo Network's Twitter page, check out our LinkedIn. Um, try and, it out. And, and I'll put it in the show notes, of course. Yeah, download the, give us some feedback, join the network. Um, you know, the, when you join the network, it takes your, your name and your phone number and you have to download an app. And some people in the space have expressed hesitance saying, oh, like, you know, we don't wanna, we don't wanna give you that information. All the information is in your control. It's encrypted and the network actually is the vault. So you're safe and you're in full control. Interesting. All right, it, let, 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 me, let me shift over to something else that seems to be one of your interests. So, DeFi? DeFi. DeFi. <laughs> oh well, yeah, we're going down the list, right? But- uh, oh, Not that one. <laughs> sorry, Mark, we're, yes, we're gonna do DeFi. So just, just, uh, just wax poetic about DeFi, where you see it, where, it's challenges where you see it's going and where you and your projects may, may, may be taking it. The total value locked into DeFi has gone up 28% since October. We're at $14.5 billion locked into DeFi today. Uh, the amount of users has gone up by 65% since October. This is according to Dune Analytics. We now have a million users using DeFi. And this is really just the beginning of rewriting financial infrastructure in for web 3.0. This is just the beginning. And I like to place focus on uh, companies like Credo that are building the, 
the, the core infrastructure that is going to be necessary for the proliferation of decentralized apps. The, it's all about the infrastructure. And when you look at companies like Credo, Aave, Synthetix, Zero X, mm-hmm. Hyper Network, uh, Compound, YFI, Yearn, uh, Sushi Swap, I mean, these companies are innovating at such a rapid pace. Project Serum, Solana. Um, you know, you could even just write a bot that just tracks the number of lines of code being shipped week over week from these open source uh, repositories. And um, I'm very bullish on decentralized governance. And um, I think it's a really powerful tale to see that Andreessen Horowitz has launched a $500 million fund that is going to focus on decentralized governance and layer two. So such a, a half a billion dollar fund is kind of setting the tone mm-hmm. of the space. And what, what's your, so, here, let, let me ask you this, um, two years from now, where do you, where do you see this? Today, $30 million per week is uh, being requested by institutional investors in, right, in, in, in crypto, 30 million per week. This number is about to, uh, if I were to guess, I think it's going to between three to five X. I think DeFi as a market is about to 10 X. Wow. Uh, this is, it's super early. The, you have to already have been in crypto to get in. The learning curve is still super high. You know, you have to watch videos from people like DeFi Dad to kind of start wrapping your brain around how to get into DeFi. Even as someone who's been a Bitcoin and Ethereum investor, I had to take time to wrap my brain around DeFi mm-hmm. when I aggressively started looking into this about, you know, I've been, we've been talking about DeFi for a long time. Sure. You know, Bitcoin, the original DeFi. But in terms of this this movement that has started and been spearheaded by companies like Compound and Synthetics and Solana and uh, uh, you know, Kyber Network and Zero X and Credo, right? Like this has been something where we've really started going in January of this year, the beginning of this year is where we started to go heads down, DeFi, DeFi, DeFi. This is going to be huge. And most people, the real market only got into it during DeFi summer. They call it DeFi summer. We, mm-hmm. we we were, it was early to be hardcore into it in January. And even that is not early. People have been, you know, the <clears throat> one thing oh, about sorry, DeFi. Let, let, let me ask you, is DeFi, do you think it's a natural evolution or outcome of FinTech or is it its own unique thing? It is a part of FinTech in my book because okay. it's, rewriting, it's rewriting FinTech. Mm. Mm. Web3. Okay. And another thing about DeFi is investing in DeFi is interesting <clears throat> in that, Investors really have to think for the long term. You can't just invest and kiss. You can't just invest the early stage round and kind of kiss the company goodbye. Good investors in this space are investing in funding the liquidity on the dexes. Good investors in this space of DeFi are actually helping with staking and governance, and they're actually staking on these protocols, and they're actually funding the liquidity on the dexes. I, I say that twice because funding liquidity is one of the keys. A lack of liquidity is a massive problem. And, you know, the top five, the, the top five blue chip DeFi projects, their early stage investors were funding liquidity on DEXs for three years. You know, people like Three Arrows Capital, sure. Spartan Capital, Framework Labs, these guys were funding liquidity on DEXs as long term investors for the last three years before people were talking about DeFi. I, I, you were such a knowledgeable and and tapped in guy. How does someone get to be like you? And I'm not asking that sarcastically. Like, really? I don't know. Read. Read a lot. Wake up early. Well, right. dude, I got up at four o'clock for this show. So, I, you know, I'm def- I got the early part covered. Uh, okay, fair enough. Yeah, let, 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 me, let me try something. We, we got some good people jumping in here. So, Anthem... I, I see you're there. I don't, if you can, if you want to take yourself off mute and say hi, if you want, Jared, you're welcome to. Anthem Gold, Anthem Bitcoin. Yeah, yeah. Steven, you're you're welcome to. And Mar- Marco, if your audio is better and you have a question, feel feel free. 
Well, I love your, your comment there. How do you get to be like Hartesh? Yeah. Right. This is, I think, what's going to happen. I think we're going to see a lot more of this now that we've had this quarantine crap and people have been sitting at home with nothing to do. And some of them have sat there and played video games and watched television. And, you know, they finished Netflix and they moved on to Amazon Prime and they're probably finished Prime, too. So now they're moving on to Hulu. Uh, right. <laughs> uh, By the way, the and boys, then the people just, who just decided quick, the boys on Amazon is awesome. That's all I'm going to say. Please go on. Yeah. Uh, the, well, I mean, that's my point. What are you doing, Gordon? Uh, right. <laughs> the uh, the uh, one of the things I get a kick out of, and maybe you've noticed this too, Hartej, is uh, that the distraction is something that is very popular. Um, when really, what you really want to be focusing on is traction, <laughs> not distraction. Uh, traction means that instead of watching TV, you go grab the last two years uh, of uh, Scientific American and read it all and just broaden your horizons. Or you go and you decide, well, I don't know how to program in Python, let's go learn that. Uh, my most recent case was I didn't really understand uh, how to use Linux interactively in a command line. I mean, I knew how it worked, I just had never bothered to do it. And I decided, well, damn it, I've got nothing better to do. And now I've got myself running three validators and I'm learning a heck of a lot about uh, debugging and such. Um, the key of what you that's how I've done it I heard you say the word learning again and again and mm -hmm. the key is the humans need to learn how they learn for me personally what changed my life was YouTube and and I know there's going to be there's library and there's lots of new platforms where we can digest media but for me you know YouTube was the beginning and it was being able to watch YouTube videos at 2x speed I'm ready for even faster with the subtitles on and yes going down the rabbit hole of what I'm personally interested in. And now when I found Bitcoin, there was a lot of Andre Andreas Antonopoulos videos that were an hour and a half long that I had to get through. And he was died. He was helping me digest some really technical stuff and making it easy for someone who's um, not super technical like me. I'm not a full stack engineer. And it was, it was great to just down digest those videos. And now fast forward, eight years, there's so many more videos. There's a guy named Anthony Pompliano and mm -hmm. you know, there's all these characters that are putting out newsletters and content. And I don't mean to call Pomp a character, even though he is one. No, he's a character. Super nice, super great guy. But you know, these guys didn't exist when I got into Bitcoin and girls. Uh, you, you, have, you can follow Melton, you can follow uh, Elena Satoshi, found the founder of Tracer. You have some amazing ladies and gentlemen that have been building, building this space ground up for a really long time. And now, you know, Elena helped write the little Bitcoin book. You have Bitcoin books that are available. And one of my favorite Bitcoin books out there is William Mogier's uh, Business of the Blockchain. It's the one book that I think paints the best picture of the future of Web3 to a non-technical person, business of the blockchain. And then the next book is now in DeFi by Camilla Russo. I'm forget, forgetting the title, but I think that's the best book to really grasp. Say, say it one more time, I'm sorry. Just Camilla, can... she, she's the author. She used to write for crypto at Bloomberg and now she's running her podcast and wrote this amazing book about DeFi. Um, yeah, those are my two go-to recommended books for if anybody I'm hiring, I want them to read Camilla Russo's DeFi book. I want them to read William Mogier's Business of the Blockchain. Mm -hmm. And that's, of course, after they've already read the Bitcoin white paper and watched some, some basic videos. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> read, read the white paper right. 10 times. <laughs> Yeah, yeah I mean, the, and what, hard to, what you're saying is perfectly uh, is perfect is learn how you learn and then never stop learning. And, and if, for me, I've also found that uh, getting pigeonholed, spending too much time learning one thing linearly uh, gets in the way of me absorbing. So I find myself going from, you know, I'll spend a couple of hours learning uh, about how to write uh, scripts in bash <laughs> and then. I'll go off and I'll learn about quantum mechanics uh, or I'll go off and learn how to bake a cake or something else that's completely not coding. Yeah, it's true. 
Yeah, we we need to learn how we learn. I, I'm very visual. Videos work great for me. Uh, so, sorry, just quick, real quick. So Ben Lee, I, I just want to make sure I don't lose it. He put in the chat. Chat. He said, "Hey Hartej, what's the podcast again?" I think it's called the Defiant. Um, let me look. I'm trying to find it for you. Just look if you can just Google Camilla Russo, C A M I L A R U S S O. Um, I'm, yeah, it's it's the Defiant podcast. D E F I A N T. She's the author of this book called The Infinite Machine. The Infinite Machine, great, fantastic, and excellent book. Um, I'm not invested in this book. I'm just a fan, and Camilla Russo is a, a a friend that I've met at several conferences when she was a journalist. Um, and I think she has done an incredible job of helping you understand the rise of Ethereum and the future of D. How transformation is playing out. She's done a really great job. Um, I think it's easy. A lot of people uh, got jaded after the 2017 um, ICO craze. And now. <clears throat> it's important to kind of really grasp what's happening with DeFi. Um, yeah, it, a lot of people were like, oh, I don't want to touch a shit coin again. Now I'm just going to focus on Bitcoin. And that's fine. I mean, so I got to make back all the money I lost. Just kidding. <laughs> I know. Mean, <laughs> like, you know, you, you, you can tell, you can tell, like, like you, I'm, not, I'm definitely not OG, but like, like, like you said, if you stick out and just keep your relationships through a couple bear markets, then you know that someone will stick around. Yeah. And speaking of Bitcoin and DeFi, if you're interested in learning more about where DeFi fits into Bitcoin, um, look into RSK. And Diego and Gabriel, the RSK team has been building for a very, very long time, and they're bringing right. uh, they're bringing Bitcoin to uh, to DeFi, and it's very interesting. Um, they have a yeah, they've been they built RIF, which is uh, an on chain RIF on chain. They launched it's a uh, a Bitcoin backed stable coin that's pegged to the US dollar through smart contracts. And uh, it's uncensorable by centralized parties. Uh, it's a secure medium of payment for users. Um, it's it's kind of their version of Maker, which wow. I haven't even thought about Maker even once. And I really like Maker, very interesting. But yeah, this is the Bitcoin version of Maker launched by RSK. Very interesting. Doesn't your blood rush and get excited when you talk about all this? I'm like, I'm feeling it. Like, like viscerally. It, yeah, I. That's why I wake up and I don't care what day it is. I kind of have the same routine. I enjoy working. I enjoy getting to my standing desk. I enjoy researching in the crypto space. I enjoy investing in the space. I enjoy building in the space, and I love the people in the space. That's probably been the best part. Is I've actually built friendships with people in this space where I talk to them more than my family and my best friends that I grew up with. Mm -hmm. I have people who I now call my best friends that I met just through the crypto space. And I'm, I'm forever grateful. These people uh, are, have, are, they continue to support me the way family members do. So how do we, how do we post COVID or in this ongoing COVID world or just looking forward, how do we accelerate the integration and progress of this community? I, I, I'm struggling with that, and I wonder, I'd like to hear your insights. Crypto has grown ever since COVID started. Crypto companies have grown ever since COVID started, possibly even more than other companies in tech. COVID has accelerated how powerful it is to operate the way people in crypto have been for a very long time. We already, we already have friends that all moved to places like Puerto Rico and to Antigua and to Bahamas, you know, we have people that have just been shifting and Caymans. their entire life. Mm -hmm. Caymans. Caymans, all, yes. Right? Like we have been, our industry has been very futuristic for a long time. I don't think COVID shook any of us up that drastically. No. I, I get it. I miss, I miss, I miss real conferences. That's definitely the biggest change. Um, and th they're going to come back. Um, but, you know, this is a, a crypto is the opportunity for the the person who doesn't have a bank account and has never flown to America and lives in a country that maybe most of us haven't visited 
And it's up to us in crypto to be very open to that person. Okay, that, that's solid. Let, let me, it's interesting because we can all talk about the effect that it's had, but in terms of getting proactive about it, there was a key takeaway there, which is be don't sort of geographically discriminate on who you're interacting with because you, you never know. And they're the things that were previously kind of count against them, whether it's language or geography, even if that didn't matter as much as it used to before, it really doesn't matter now. Correct. But I, I think you're I think you're saying you have a certain open Zen like approach and not so, pre, not presuppose. Yeah, and American culture, I'll be honest, American business culture is extremely discriminatory, discriminatory. Mm -hmm. We have we have over 170 plus regulatory arms just regulating the financial sector in the United States. So for fair reason, people are pretty scared. They're like, oh, where are you? Where's the IP? Are your engineers going to run? In crypto, we, ha we have to be open-minded. Someone could be in Nairobi and the other mm -hmm. CTO could be in Kiev, Ukraine. And the lead engineers are currently spending time in the Alps of France because they love skiing and it's winter and they rented out a cabin to just focus and build and ship code for six months. Like it, it really doesn't matter. You got to make it work how you're going to make it work. And you got to make your investors money and make your investors comfortable that you don't need to be in an office cooped up that an investor can walk into every single day. And if you do, maybe you have the wrong investor. Um, and we get, we got to just, we have to evolve in these new models. So, uh, you know, I, I, I don't think any crypto investors are giving people any shit. I think that this is a, this is a, this is the COVID is going to accelerate crypto's adoption. COVID is going to accelerate. It is accelerating crypto's growth. And I don't think this way of thinking is going to just vanish even post a vaccine. I think that this is just the new way of, of approaching things. The remote, we, everybody is now used to doing things online and people who never ever did a traditional bank transaction online post COVID mm -hmm. are now doing the bank transactions online. This includes boomers and old people. People in my parents' generation are now doing everything online. Yep. Malls are, malls are gonna turn into something else. My mom lives on Amazon, it's the cutest thing. <laughs> Yeah, my mom too. By the way, all of a sudden she's yeah. on Amazon. Yeah, she's like, you know, my mom's like, I don't want to go, go to Gelson's with all those other old people in the morning. I want, I just want stuff delivered. I'm like, God bless you, mom. That's that's awesome. <laughs> well, all right, but let, 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 sorry, let, let me re ask the question. Let me let me just because I, I want to see if there's anything more there, and if there's not, it's okay because I, I don't know where the end of this is. So I, I understand the businesses are dispersed and investors. That's all point in terms of getting away from business, but just community building or strengthening the movement. Is there anything else we can proactively pound on right now, do you think? And maybe you don't have the answer. I mean, I'm asking because I don't have the answer. I'm just, look, I'm fishing for ideas. Is there, if we get, if we get out of our own heads and just look at the community, what, what can we do to add value fast and, and just take advantage of the time? Education is probably the only thing that comes to my mind. We need mm, more. Okay, that, that's a good one. The more that we can further educate people in the space and educate people that are not in this space, the world would be a better place. It's all about education. And it's, it's really wonderful to see um, how more and more people are creating quality video and written content and newsletters and more people are joining crypto Twitter and the conversations there. Um, Wouldn't it be great if we had something that was would teach people who are not by any means used to this concept, much like people weren't used to spending their lives on Amazon, uh, how to educate yourself, you know, generally not saying, you know, if you're visual, do this, if you're uh, auditory, then do this and whatever, but more, here's how in today's isolated world, you go about learning new things about anything. Right, with the uh, requisite cat catch it, uh, gotchas it already built into that little, you know, what is it, a one hour video maybe, uh, that tell you things like, you know, if somebody offers to send you uh, 10,000 Bitcoin today, if you send them uh, 5,000 Bitcoin yesterday, uh, that's probably a bad idea. <laughs> Those kinds of things, right? Uh, 
uh, the too good to be true things. Because a lot of our problem with education is not just the fact that people aren't used to doing it, but there is so much misinformation out there posing as education. Actually, that's a fantastic point. Because if we're, if we're reaching new audiences and we, that, that, I guess that that's the dark side to the education mandate, which is how do we, do we need to combat misinformation and how do we combat misinformation for the greater good? It's a tough question. Yeah, I know. I, 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 this is not a softball show, but you know, you're. While you were talking about that, my mind was more thinking about things like Senegal, the language is in Wolof, and there's not even a lot of how to learn how to code material in Wolof, right? And so there's an, a disadvantage to the fact that you were born and your native language doesn't have, there's no materials to learn how to code in your mother tongue. Okay, so I, I'm gonna sound like an imperialist white American. Shouldn't everyone just be speaking English? Shouldn't everyone be able to speak English at this point or at least understand it if you wanna play in this world? I don't think that's fair to ask of the world. Um, I, 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 I'm not making a fairness argument. In terms of if, if I'm the guy in Senegal and I wanna gain access to the resources way quickly. around the world was through rape and pillage. So to ask the world to all speak English means you already were raped and pillaged and colonized by some European colonizer likely. And if yep. you look at you know, that, the Belgians and the French and the English weren't always the best person to be colonized by, but hey, when they left or when, if they're still there, you speak English. Uh, so, okay, I, okay, fair enough. So, so what do you do if you're that guy in Senegal? We need to prepare, we, we need to leverage technology to make it so that someone in Senegal can learn in their own mother tongue. And, it, and if they can get material to, we should also give them material to learn English if they're so willing, that would be wonderful. And yes, English is the global business language today. However, um, wouldn't it be great if they could learn in their own mother tongue? There's a lot of people that would like to keep their own mother tongues alive. And when a mother tongue dies, well, there's a saying in my mother tongue that says, when a kid forgets his mother tongue, he will one day forget his mother. Well, uh, no, I agree with that. You know, it, it's like there's that Achilles thing. Is so just, a man is alive so long as the last person who remembers him alive is alive. They, once that person, once the last living memory of that person is gone, they're really gone. Yeah, you know, Ukraine, where in Ukraine, mother tongue is also such a big deal. They, they, were, they were a part of the Soviet Union in the past. So people here still speak Russian. They speak Russian in a, in a very Ukrainian specific style, if you know. Oh um, yeah, that's my But people really, um, they're proud of their Ukrainian language. It's Kiev spelled with a Y, not an I. This is uh, Ukraine. They speak Ukrainian. Um, it is a completely separate language. Wait, I, 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 it's so funny. Like I, I grew up spelling it with an I and I put it on social media one week ago I bet it made this big announcement and said, okay, friends, I'm switching to the KYIV. Since I have so many Ukrainian friends, I'm making the switch. And, and just to be clear, I wasn't saying surrender your, your base tongue. Okay, I, and you know, it, it's, a, it's a trope that Americans don't speak other languages. Like I'm going out my, I speak German, I'm going out my way for over a decade now working on my Russian. I suck, but I'm staying at it. I, I just think it adds a lot of utility to your life if you happen to speak English. It, it adds a lot of utility to your life if you happen to speak a second language in general. And but, that's why you know, for engineers, Software engineers globally have joined the global market uh, before others, right? Like my co-founder grew up in Rosario, Argentina, my previous co-founder, my first startup. And he grew up in Rosario, Argentina, but by age 15 or 16, you know, he was putting out code on GitHub on an, an international repo mm -hmm. and building up his reputation on different uh, um, code languages, right? And so, and he's been earning being paid by a California-based tech company since he was 15 years old, living in Rosario, Argentina. He's been being paid by them since then. And, uh, and he learned English by watching Hollywood movies and learning how to code. And if you become a proficient coder, you probably learn how to code by reading things in English. And so even in Ukraine, my guys here who don't speak the best English on the phone, they are great on email communication and written communication, kind of like how Pedro was saying before. Yep. Um, 
Yep, yep. So yeah. uh, let's pause a second. Tim Lewis, I, I'm glad I was able to get you on here. I I'm, I'm, I'm just wanted to say hello, Hartej. Oh. What's up, bro? What's going down? Uh, uh, how's yeah, yeah, yeah. How's, how's the family? Everyone's great. Boys are great. Wife is great. Yeah. It's great. I, I, I would invite you to Kiev if you're in Europe. Come, borders are open. Uh, well, we can. I'm eat. expecting. I, I've got a baby coming on on uh, j early oh. January. So yeah. So so, but I, I'm I'm in I'm in I'm in Germany, bro. So I'm not not right. that yeah yeah I'm not that far away at all. Hopefully, once we start moving around. We can do something. I want to do, uh, you know, we got to catch up because I've done some interesting stuff this year with uh, the DevDAO in different th different initiatives that, that, I've, that I've kicked off. And right. I really want to really want to break them down to you and catch up. It had been a while when I saw you were going to be on. I wanted to make sure I could come in and appreciate and that. Hello. Yeah, brother. Hearing all your updates on Casper calls. Yeah, good. Yeah, exactly. Well, it's, it's been good, man. You know, the market continues to move. People continue to work. I know everything's probably busy. The one question I would have is with security contracts, you know, the, 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 after, the, uh, after the boom and bust of the ICOs, but the security contracts were crazy expensive. And now with the DeFi movement, um, what are you from a contractual standpoint, um, what, what are you seeing in the marketplace? Have the, have the contracts again gone, you know, crazy expensive? Yeah, uh, it's like they're expensive because everybody's at capacity and there's a global shortage of quality human beings to look at them. And increasingly so, audit, the tooling is not catching the vulnerabilities that we need to find in DeFi, which means two to three people need to separate themselves in different rooms, or now we're actually all at home, so it doesn't matter, but they need to be completely separated and they need to like think, how would a black hat enemy exploit this? And so think about logic exploits that may not, and, and to really understand the vision of the smart con of the white paper and to marry that to the code takes manual effort more than the tooling. And um, qual I would say overall, I'm seeing a mix of some of the most mature projects we've ever seen. Where we're the third or fourth auditor and we're working with literally the best teams we've ever worked with. And then at the same time, we have a shit storm, massive storm of brand new Solidity developers new teams, new people to this space that clearly have never built and shipped something in this space. So we are a lot more than their auditors. We're teaching them about making sure you have your test suites already written out that you probably should do a thorough internal audit and you can't touch that code if you give it to us, like send us shipped code finished. Um, and we're back to people being in a rush, but we're it's up to us as auditors to just pump the brakes and say, take your time. Um, Good. Um, what, what other follow-up real quick, any, any other, any, any other languages that are becoming important? I mean, other, other than, other than Solidity, have you guys been getting asked if, if you would say that one, any other chain, have you been getting asked about any other chain or is it still? Solana has been the next one that we've been getting a couple of requests that have been. Uh, sorry, Hartash, can you repeat the name? I, I missed that. Tron. He said Tron. Tron. Okay, got it. So he's shouting out Justin Sun over there. It, and it's crazy because a couple of years ago, none of us ever would have said that name in a sentence without all going, <laughs> Nope, so here we are. Wh why do you think that is? Because they improved. Okay. They, shipped, they shipped some functioning products. And people stop, people stop calling you a scammer when they make a lot of money. <laughs> I don't know about that. Uh, hey, t -t -t Tim, <laughs> Tim, stay with us for a second. But Ben, say say hi. Happy to have you on the show. V very happy to have you on Thank the show. You. Thank you, guys. Good, good to see the familiar faces. Tim, I saw you last time in Puerto Rico. Atesh, I think I saw you consensus 2018. Yeah. And the Marco, hey yeah. man. Um, Gordon, we have been emailing, I guess. No, I know, but um, just so, happy to have you on. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. My name is Ben Le, and uh, I just want to jump on real quick to say hi. You asked a very important question, Gordon. How do we actually create an educational network where you know truth and honesty will be respected? And my question back to Batesh, when you say about you know what you're learning, what you're studying, which is incredibly inspiring, and also what Marco is saying about you know this whole year, instead of watching Netflix and Prime, whatever, go and study and really you know sharpen your mind and study new things. I my personal opinion is this: look, 
we all love crypto and blockchain. We all have incredible, incredible life changing experiences out of that. But at the same time, you know, we, we, we tend to forget that we're not the only passionate groups in the world. You know, like there's so many different groups out there. Like, you know, what I've studied this year is there's a huge revolution going on right now in terms of technology in photonics. Have you ever heard of photonics? Photonics? The study of light. Yeah, I mean, the well, whole Silicon Valley, the whole Silicon Valley was built on chips, silicon mm. chip. Right now, what we're doing right now is silicon photonics. Interesting. Where you don't consume electricity, where you don't consume energy. And that's where, to me, is the future. And blockchain will be changed by that. So that I've been incredibly deep diving to that. This company right here we started this year, Miracle Attainment. We are a TV network, FCC certified TV network. And we're going to be the first blockchain TV in the USA. And we, we're going to create a solution that will come back fake news. And that's, that, to me, is the beauty of it. You know, like, I, I love crypto because you guys think, we, we all think in a way that is, is, is beyond the convention, that is global view, that is hopefully mostly compassionate. You know, talking about open borders, talking about the unbanked. But don't forget that they are environmentalists. They are computer scientists. They are cryptographers, as you mentioned before. They are city planners. They are environmentalists. There are scientists out there. There are, you know, so many passionate groups and we tend to get into the bubble. And the, the more we open, the more we open and, and, and migrate our, our genius to really interact with, say, media. We work in TV. Nobody cares about TV. This thing. I care about TV. My team cares about TV. You know why? Because this thing right here. Ben, 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 ben right let, here. Let, let, let me jump in one second. Just, what, what you're saying is resonating with me. Just to be super clear, I went back into law. It wasn't because I saw, I, I did see an opportunity for doing legal services for crypto startups, but I, what I saw was that crypto and blockchain, it's not that they necessarily need law, but law needs it. Like law will get better through exposure to crypto and blockchain and computational uh, decision-making. I, I saw a, a way to address what I found distasteful about law and law permeates everything. Like my, I, I'm in this field personally because I want to make the world a better place. And, and I'm, I'm not just saying that because it's good PR. I'm not that guy. I'm too old to like play that game. I like, but I, I seriously, the, 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 just a little bit personal. I, the, when I was growing up, I think I'm kind of old for this group. When I was growing up, I thought by 2020, we'd be on Mars. I thought we, we lived in 120. You know, I thought the environment would be solved. I thought we had robots. I thought we'd have flying cars, all this stuff. Okay, it hasn't really happened. And I'm frustrated. I'm frustrated for humanity that it hasn't happened. It pisses me off. It pisses me off also that I'm not going to be able to walk on Mars probably. And I, I thought in 1975, you know, when I was six years old and was reading the Martian Chronicles by Ray Bradbury, I thought I was going to be able to do that. Okay, or even nine years old, whenever I was reading it. And it's annoying. So I'm, I'm with you. It's, Wait, it's, Gordon, it's, Gordon I, th I think you will be able to. So, so stop, you know, stop the, 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 stop being the so negative. Oh, no, no, no. Actually, Tim, stop, hold on. stop the giving up. No, hold on. Yeah, hold on. No, 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 no. It's not that far away, man. Hold on. Hold on. Stop. Let me punchline it. Let me punchline it. Okay. Which is what, what, and it was kind of depressing, but I saw a glimmer of hope when I went into crypto and I got to be straight about it. I think COVID has in some ways accelerated the future again. Like I finally feel like the future's beginning to be the future again. Okay, and it's what you know, Tim. You, 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 I'm thrilled you joined us. We we kind of had a little conversation about this. I, I feel it's not necessarily the future we were heading towards, but it is a future, and that future is coming faster than it would have already. So yes, there's. It's interesting. We're now beginning to release resources and value, and systems and cross germination in a way that I didn't think was going to happen. Not out of some fatalistic thing, but just like watching for all this time, and I'm freaking pumped. So Ben, I, I can I can complete. <laughs> Tim, this is why you and I are involved. I mean, you know, just be real. Tim and I are working on the DevDAO project along with a whole, and Marco and a whole big group of very dedicated people because I think we see the future and want to make it happen and make it happen right. And the idea between DAOs and DeFi and all this is, Ben, to your point, they're, they're generally applicable tools. They don't live in silos. They're, their glory is when they're applied to other areas and other areas are applied to them. So I, I'm, I'm with you. Because of people like you, Gordon, the pioneers, the people who see beyond your legal profession and your, 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 
we, we all have this story. To me, I, I, I love this community because, you know, they, you see the future is not going to be Harvard, Stanford, Yale legal attorneys. They don't, they just going to be, they, they're less than the machine that scan text. People well, like I, I don't want to hit on them, but they, they need to get out of the, they need to get out of the big firm mentality and freaking yeah. be pirate pirate lawyers. They need to learn how to code. They need to learn how to communicate with people and not be jerks. They need to learn yeah. how to be creative, and they need to get out of their national bubbles. Okay, and it, it's uh, an ongoing that's struggle. True. That, you know, it, it, there's this famous statement like the hardest thing in the world is to see what's right in front of your face every day. Okay, that's like the hardest thing to just see what's right in front of your eyes, and you know, a lot of these people have their worldviews that they just need to be shattered so they can go on and be better people. So that, that's- I don't want to take more time, but I just want to end with this as an invitation. We are creating the next DRC20 protocol that will allow anybody to issue any chain, any tokens on any chain at near zero cost fee. And we're going to implement that with a bandwidth proof blockchain. So Marco knows something about that. I approached him, Atesh, I may reach out to you. Uh, I don't know anybody here would like to do some research together. But we're going to make blockchain TV. Remember that miracle attainment. I think miracle we're going to do a show on this. Yeah, blockchain TV sounds like, <laughs> like a great idea. Tim Hartesh, awesome. you, you know what? I think we're going to wrap with you guys. So Tim, maybe you want to throw another question or comment to Hartesh. And that seems like ending on a high note. If, there, if there's anything you care to breach or add into this. You know, you know, Hartesh, you know, you, for over the last four or five years, I saw you all across the world. And it had been so fun to be traveling and getting everywhere. Um, you know, I, I have my own feelings on this and thoughts about it, but um, how are you handling the, the virtual conferences and, and have you found any that are, you know, really, really great? I, I love this Wednesday bit that Jordan has done because it's fun. It puts a lot of people together, familiar faces, but be, which, which have you seen? Best one I've experienced to date. I'll be, I wasn't actually invited as a speaker because I'm not as cool as people like Tim and Gordon, but uh, I... I signed in, it was the Misari crypto one. Mm. And it was so cool and seamless how you had this speed dating mechanism where you were forced to be in front of somebody completely random. You had a couple of seconds to decide if you both wanted to stay on this chat and you had no idea it was a lottery of who this person could be. And um, I think I only skipped one because the person was a PR, P, trying to sell me PR. <laughs> and I was- That's there's, there's, there's no such thing as crypto PR. Next. That, that sounds amazing. What, what's the, what's the, what is that chat network that, that people used to do that with, right? So it would basically just, chat. it was basically chat roulette. Yeah. Oh my God. Not? <laughs> chat roulette for conferences is, is, is not a bad thing. I'm gonna, I'll go check and see what they did on that. Good tip, Hartesh. You create tip. Like this invite only circle. If you really honed in and you brought the right people, um, forcing people to quickly be like video on and you're meeting them one-on-one -on -one, so cool it, it, you know it's a the equivalent of uh, a serendipitous collision during the happy hour at a conference which is the main thing i care about as a conference is just meeting other people yeah go to conferences for, for the keynote speech uh i i like to learn on youtube at 2x speed and he's not speaking at 2x speed in the, in the hall i don't i don't got time for that I want right. to hang out with Tim in the hallway, give him a big old hug, and talk about a, like life followed by business, followed by life. <laughs> yeah, God, love it, um, Sandra. I, 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 I Ardez, this has been amazing. I, I think we're at our time, it's Sandra. I, I think it's time to land the plane. Would you agree? Yeah, the, 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 it's really cool because we we had a, a good view also on the on the YouTube channel where we're streaming live mm -hmm. since of last week. We tested it out. We this is really picking up. It's, it's cool. Yeah. And we, we have to give a shout out also to uh, Eloisa, who was our speaker last week, because yeah. she, she was the first one on the on the live YouTube stream. And she put it towards her own context, her network. We got, a, I think, over five or 600 live viewers during the show, that, which was really fantastic. Yep. And that's what, what it's all about, Gordon, because, you know, when we started this show five or six months ago, our main purpose, well, we had se several purposes. One is to give back to the community, right? Mm -hmm. Because it's not only about, you know, what you want to achieve, it's about the bigger perspective, the, the, the higher goal, the higher purpose. And we said, okay, we should get our best friends and, and, and partners and strategic guys and girls involved in this goal and, and, and let them contribute on whatever they're excited about, what they're willing to share. 
And also that we provide, let's say, a platform. And it's a non-commercial platform, by the way. So there's no commercial pitching or whatsoever. But we are facilitating. So everybody is able to network with one uh, another, not only during the show, but also in the Telegram group, in the in the LinkedIn page, in Facebook. We are all over the uh, all over the place. So I'm really happy to see that people are connecting. You know, we're making the bridge. We're happy to see that people like Marco, people like Tim, you know, uh, Pedro are joining the, the show frequently. We're really appreciate it we always say it yeah. but Bless we, you all. we truly <laughs> are grateful for you guys to come on the show and keep on coming back because we need you guys you know we, we all need each other to we need more girls we need more yeah, yeah. actually we're, to be honest we're working on that <laughs> I, and i and i'm not kidding you know i'm still i i know you're not kidding and i really believe you and i you know we don't you don't need um you don't need to have a show called women in blockchain to uh. to to bring in a lot of the leading women and, and, and young ladies in this space. Um, Cause it, they're, they're already, they've been here since the beginning. And uh, I've never been to a core uh, crypto event where the people running it um, and organizing, like being the pillars of this community were not women. So I could. No, you hundred percent. I'm, I'm, I'm with the program. You know, we, I, actually, I, I guess I'll point this out. The, uh, the, the majority of the people I've interacted in this with in this field have been male. Is it, that's just the way it shook out, and I don't think it was because of any internal any internal bias. It's just no. that's the way it shook out. But yeah. I don't. But just because that's how it shook out, that doesn't mean that's how it has to stay. And I, I think you can, you know, Tim and I, I think I've talked about this. You know, it's good to be proactive. It's good to be open mm -hmm. when the universe says something. Don't get defensive. Don't get not invent here syndrome. Just be open. Okay, the world is here to teach us and help us evolve and be better. I try to do that politically. I try to do that emotionally. I try to do that philosophically. And so, yeah, you know, I, a couple of things had to happen a few times before a pattern emerges. But I, I did notice in the show that we don't have enough women speakers. We don't have enough. It's not that we don't have enough. It's that you might want to. That, that's almost a negative framing. It's more like I just want more. I just want yeah. more. I know there's good people out here, and I want to talk to them. And I think diversity, you know, I, my, my English comment from before was, I just want to be able to talk to people and hear what they think. And, you know, that's why I'm learning Russian. That's why it's nice for me if they learn English and we kind of meet somewhere in the middle. But yeah, I, I, it's good to get different perspectives. And the show I'm doing, James, you know, we're really going out of our way to get female speakers. And I think it's a fantastic idea. So yeah. I, I endorse. But I think you should be mindful of uh, uh, thinking about your format. I don't know. This format has been fine for me. It's been fun. Maybe... Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, one thing I've learned is that um, when you have like a, a conference room and everyone is just barking across the table, um, some women colleagues of mine tend to not speak up as much when we've had those types of scenarios where we're just a bunch of men in, around a table and I'm, over, I'm speaking over you and you're cutting me off and I'm cutting you off. Uh, all of a sudden, this genius female colleague of mine next to me just hasn't shared her opinion for the last 40 minutes. And it took all of us to kind of realize, calm down and ask her to kind of chime in. Maybe she was nervous. Maybe she just didn't feel comfortable. Um, we're different species and we need to be mindful of uh, kind of what, making everybody feel comfortable. And, uh, you know, we got to think about different formats to make different people feel comfortable. And yeah, I'd love to see, I'd love to see more women in, in these types of chats and not just the same super famous ones. Uh, I'd yeah, I'd love to see Meltem just conquer and be hey, everywhere. If you, if you, I, I'm open to suggestions if you know people. And, yeah. and, 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 you know, and also, let, let me validate your point. I, I, think you're, I think you're correct. Our normal format, which I actually intentionally broke with for this show, was the first half is just Sandra and I one-on-one -on -one with the guest or the panel. And the second half, we open it up. And that's to, because both provide a lot of value. And our alumni group, like Tim and, and Pedro mm -hmm. and Marco, add so huge value when they chip in. But we just felt like mixing it up this time because you're you. Uh -huh. Yeah, I'm an extroverted male on top of that. So I like, <laughs> have an introvert and that'll be different. Like, you know, I'm. Yeah, yeah. I'm but but I, I appreciate the idea, Artesh. I think I think it's good. And let, let's make it a group effort of, of identifying, you know, the, 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 the ladies out there who want to contribute because we're an open platform. We're, we're here for everybody, not for a specific uh, target group. So I'm looking forward to, uh, to inviting more uh, different kinds of people to the show. A little but, bit of I'm sure if you go down the rabbit hole of research, just take the top 50 crypto companies, 
go through their, their early employees, find females that b- probably founded one of those companies, if not as one of the early first 10 employees. And there's all kinds of gems out there. And a lot of those ladies I personally found um, aren't interested in being famous and loud, but yeah. they've been in crypto since 2012, 2013. They've been, they're full stack yeah. engineers. They're sec- I know security experts. We have a security auditor on my team. That's one of the, she's a female, super quiet, super introverted. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so there's uh, some of the most impressive women in the world that I've ever met are in this space. Uh, Elizabeth Stark, Stacey Herbert, uh, Elena, Sat- Elena Satoshka, founder of the Tracer Wallet, uh, no big deal. Just the just the tracer. Yeah, no big no big deal. Okay, okay. Listen, I'm calling the show. Point taken. Point taken to heart. I'm with you. And you, a woman, seem even say you convinced me because I was already convinced. But you just put a catalyst in the pot, a big one. So I want to thank you for that. I, I I love getting the feedback. You know, Tim's provided a lot of constructive feedback too. And you know, Marco and I bantered back and forth. It's been great. This you know, I grow as a person interacting with everyone. So I, I just want to say thank you. Um, oh, thank you for having me, guys. Thank you. All right, guys, I'm ending the recording now. <laughs>